to Felix Schupp, who will give the next talk on a related topic. And he will speak about um, three integrated device architectures for hybrid superconductor, semiconductor, quantum dot devices. <coughs> I want to just quickly acknowledge that this work is a collaboration with MIT Lincoln Labs because it's very fabrication heavy and they help us with the cavity chips. All right, so um, I think this slide I can um, sort of explain very quickly because you just saw the uh, explanation of the experiment that we're trying to do from, from Felix himself. So, um, you know, you have these kind of uh, chips with a cavity and the two double quantum knots. The gate stack looks like this. You've seen all this. And um, then you have this trick with the micromagnet that as you put the electron back and forth, it sees a different field such that you can couple this way. Um, and then, you know, you have to play some tricks to make it work from one spin to the other with this angle and so on, but you just heard all about this. Um, so instead, what I get to do now is, because Felix explained this so well, is I can explain to you why his experiment is actually not very good. <laughs> um, and um, no, I'm kidding, of course, it's a great experiment, it's a great achievement, but in terms of what we set out to do, which is develop a platform and a quantum computing architecture, it's actually really not that good because we're not really anywhere close to having a good two qubit gate, right? That's certainly not high fidelity. Um, so how can we improve this? Well, Felix touched on it, right? There's these three parameters. There's G, there's um, gamma, gamma and kappa. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is you get the gate either very fast, right? And people are working on these high impedance cavities. Um, it's typically something like, like these materials, nylon, titanium nitride, or squid arrays. And um, the idea is that you get a high electric field per microwave photon, and that will increase your coupling strength. Um, of course, at some point you're limited by strain capacitance, because you might couple to everything else as well. But um, yeah, that's a valid approach. We're trying to do that, and other groups are also trying to do that already. Um, now, the second part is you can reduce losses. Um, and the first one we just discussed about the, the charge noise. The first one is reduce the qubit loss, which will be dominated by charge noise. And you can really reduce that if you treat it in a single quantum dot, um, because then you lose the dipole moment and you're not susceptible to charge noise. But at the same time, of course, you lose your coupling strength. So there's not really that much you can do there. Maybe a little um, optimization, but not, not really that much. Uh, so we think where you can win bigger might be the cavity loss. And in this context, I want to say like the cues or the quality factors in these experiments in Princeton and also everywhere else um, are only the quality factors around you know a few thousand, which is really poor compared to what people can do in superconducting qubits. And we think that at least in part that's due to incompatibilities in the fabrication. Because if you want to put a qubit and a uh, cavity on the same chip, then the problem you're going to have is that you have lots of lossy materials from the qubit uh, fabrication. So you have oxides, you have normal conductors, you have a micromagnet, and all this stuff is not good for your cavity. So this is why we, we look at the separated <laughs> fabrication, right? So if we do 3D integration, we can have one chip that is the cavity, and it's set, you know, optimized in its own environment, and then you can have a second chip that's a qubit. Um, and then the other thing you can improve is the magnetic field resilience. Um, because, of course, in spin qubits, you want to Siemens splitting, at least in our type of qubit. And, um, yeah, and you're going you're gonna to need a field. All right, so this is what it looks like. Um, here's a cut drawing of our full design. So you can see the bottom looks, the, the gray chip, that's a quantum dot chip, looks very much like what Felix showed you earlier. So you still have this, these little holes where the quantum dots live. Um, uh, but you don't actually have a cavity, so I think on this projector you can see it decently well. So here, this is just like a gap down here. Um, but the cavity is actually on a turquoise chip. So I'm trying to trace it out because sometimes you don't see it so well. Um, so this, this cavity chip, we actually get made by Lincoln Labs in Boston. So they have basically a foundry environment. And they can make very good cavities that for, at least for the level of loss that we're talking about, are basically perfect. So, um, all right, so we have that chip, and now we have to connect it to the quantum dot chip, and we have all these uh, interconnects. These are indium bond bonds. Um, that's what we use. We use thermal compression bonding. And um, 
Most of these are just ground plane to ground plane, but a few of them, and I've, I've highlighted them, they are for uh, the actual signal path. Um, so here's, here are pictures from the actual device. So here I've pulled off the top chip of one of those devices, um, and these are SEM pictures. So what you see here is basically ripped off uh, Indian bombs. All right. Now let's look at some data. So here on the left, you see the transmission through two, two of those devices as a function of frequency. Um, the blue data points, this is kind of the reference device. So here the, um, the cavity chip is from Lincoln Labs, but also the bottom chip is from Lincoln Labs. So this is actually no chip that is any good for quantum dots. It's just kind of the platform, right? So it's, and we see that the quality factor is around 100,000, again, compared to a few thousand, that's excellent. Um, but of course, we need to see what happens if we actually move closer to the, to the spin qubit. Now, before I do that, I quickly want to mention, this is basically like a, you can think of it as a platform for all kinds of hybrid devices, because in principle, you don't have to put a spin qubit on the bottom chip, you can put something else. Um, we, of course, want to move towards spin qubits, and that's a red curve, so, this is not a full chip, this is still a test chip, but it has basically all the materials that you would want. So it has the oxides, it followed the recipe from a quantum dot fab, it has normal conductors, and it has uh, this kind of layer that kind of looks very similar to the, to the first gate layer that Felix showed, right? So this is aluminum. Um, all right, so, you know, we still get a quality factor of almost 70K, um, but, you know, of course it might go down even more if we do the full chip, so yeah, we, we have to do the final experiment. But so far it's promising. Um, another quick test you can do to probe losses is you measure this as a function of the photon number. So that's what we do here. And you see both devices follow a two-level system model, which is uh, expected for cavities. Um, also, of course, for the real experiments, you would want to operate in a few photon regimes somewhere around here, so it's the realistic scenario anyway. Right, now the second thing I wanted to talk about is the internal losses in magnetic fields. Um, and uh, what we use here is we borrow a technique from superconducting qubits, which is ground plane perforations. Um, and uh, the idea is the following. So uh, if you have a magnetic flux penetrating this, this ground plane, which is niobium type 2, um, and it's not really bound to anything, then, what you, then the microwave photon can drive that uh, that flux quantum, and that can be a dissipative process, so that's why you use photons, right? And your, your quality factor will go down. Um, and that's why, because we need an external field, um, we just apply it in parallel to the, to the ground plane. And the reason is that in, that in that case, the flux density of your field must be high enough such that a, a flux quantum fits in the cross-section of the, of the ground plane. So if you have a very thin ground plane, nothing's going to fit until a few Tesla, right? Um, well, and that's, so that's in theory if you can perfectly align your external field to ground plane, which of course you cannot. Um, so you have some sort of perpendicular um, field components from that, and then you have a micromagnet which induces small perpendicular field components. So, and that's why um, these ground plane perforations are helpful. And you can see that here. So this quality effect is a function of, you know, supposedly perfectly parallel field, but it's of course not. And um, you can compare the last two devices I showed and then the one with the ground plane perforations. And you can see the resilience to feel this much better. We are aiming for experiments uh, somewhere here, around 100 millitesla, and we can see we still have like <coughs> six. Okay. Um, one thing I didn't talk about is, of course, you have the Indian bumps. And those will be perpendicular to the field for sure, right? So um, Indium has a critical field around 30 millitesla, so it's very likely they're going to be normal conducting. And it's actually very encouraging that we do not get a huge drop somewhere in that area, right? Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, and with that I want to just quickly conclude. So, you know, I've, I've shown that sort of architecture where we separate the cavity and the qubit fabrication. Um, and because we can then optimize our fabrication separately, we get at least the test devices, reduced losses, uh, we can use ground plane perforations to improve the magnetic field resilience, and importantly, the Indian bump bombs with a, you know, with a critical field around 30 millitesla do not seem to destroy the Q. Um, the outlook, well, of course, uh, we have to do the full experiment, 
Um, and then in sort of the more distant future, you can also think of this as a way to build a processor architecture, because this is, this is sort of our most scaled up type of device. That's nine dots here, and then three, three chart sensing dots. And you can already see the, the length scale is 200 nanometers, right? So, um, you know, a quantum lattice is maybe 100 nanometers, and the gate fan out is like already pretty bad here. So, and that's why people in, that think about processor architectures come up with something like this, right? So you have these sort of blocks of next neighbor coupled spin qubits, because if you make them much larger, then uh, you might run into trouble with the gate fan out. Um, so that's why uh, the long range qubit coupler, for instance, with a microwave photon would come in. Um, all right, with that I want to thank you, and then open a question. Thank you, Felix, for this very nice talk about um, three integration of, of spin qubits. Is there any questions from the audience? So maybe I get started. So when you say three integration, um, can I imagine this to go beyond just adding one flip chip on top? But, so that, that you know it can stack up many of those layers, and would this be then alternating layers of, say, um, resonators and spin qubit layers? Yeah, so if you look at this paper, actually, Dana Rosenberg, she's our uh, collaborator at uh, Lincoln Labs, and she did sort of the same thing for superconducting qubits. Uh, so what they had is three chips. At the bottom one um, contains, I think, those functions. And then there's one that just sort of routes signals, and the other one has the cavity. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if there's no more questions, then we move on and thank Felix again. So, I want to take this opportunity to tell you that a lot of people are watching us because I just received an email from Michael Birchow from Quantum Control telling us that now the Virtual March Meeting website has been officially endorsed by the APS. So, if you want to upload your presentation online, I encourage you to do that on this platform, which now will give you basically connection to the official APS um, you know, community, and also, I guess, um, identify a system where people can find your presentations through your um, talk number.